So yeah, uh, thanks for having me back here and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's always good to be back at ICTS. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, these two works actually. So let's just uh, get started. So what is the motivation for uh, these two works? It's like, you know, there are various uh, platforms where you, where we now try to build like quantum devices. So these are some of them. And uh, what are some of the common properties of all of them? Uh, so first of all, they are microscopic objects, but uh, they are not really like a single body, right? They are many body. Uh, they are inherently noisy and dissipative uh, because isolation from the surroundings is neither possible, also nor often uh, desired actually, because you want to control these things uh, in the experiment. And uh, they typically work by driving the system out of equilibrium, for example, via voltage bias. Okay, so now these, so these are basically you know driven dissipative quantum many body systems, and uh, we'd like to know the dynamics to model these kind of uh, settings. We like to know the uh, model the dynamics of uh, such systems. Okay, so the most commonly used technique is via this Lindblad equations, uh, which makes this assumption of Markovian dynamics. And uh, this uh, assumption uh, relies on this weak system bath coupling or like infinite temperatures or infinite chemical potential bias and so on. Uh, some of these things may not be true in the experiments. Also, it may be even harder to realize in the experiments. The, if you do not have this Markovian assumption, then uh, one of the most uh, standard techniques is uh, this non-equilibrium Green's functions. Now, if you have only a linear system, so like free fermions and so on, then this works very well. If you uh, do not have any, if you have any nonlinearities like here, then you need some kind of small parameter and you have to set up a perturbation theory for that, okay? So uh, actually one thing I want to mention is like, you know, this Lindblad equations have some fundamental limitations that we kind of uh, wrote in this paper. Uh, it, and it has been uh, clear actually, there are many, many works uh, uh, in this direction also. So what happens if you do not, if you are away from Lindblad uh, description and if you are also, if you do not have any small parameter in your system, then uh, what do you do? And uh, so that is the kind of thing that uh, is uh, the motivation for this. And okay, and some, uh, at least uh, some, uh, some people are of course interested in um, trying to formulate the thermodynamics of such kind of systems and trying to see like uh, what, new things we get out of it. So what I'm going to say is this idea of periodically refresh baths, okay? So it offers an interesting way for both to simulate the dynamics and some interesting thermodynamics uh, perspectives also. So let's go to the dynamics one, which is the content of this paper. Okay, so this is what we want to simulate, okay? So something like this, so something, we have something small, um, but many body inside, so finite number of degrees of freedom. And that is coupled to something, things which are much bigger, so which essentially have infinite numbers of degrees of freedom, okay? So the system can be, is this, the whole thing is described by some total Hamiltonian. Uh, now the bath degrees of freedom are described by, uh, you know, an infinite number of bosonic or fermionic modes. And uh, the system bath coupling is taken like this, where S can be any system operator, but this bath operator is, you know, this annihilation operator of uh, uh, bath modes, okay? So this kind of uh, system bath coupling, this is the kind of uh, the standard starting point for most of open quantum systems. And then, um, you know, how do you build in this temperature? So the baths are initially at their own temperatures and chemical potentials, which can all be different. And uh, the system is in some state and this entire thing is in production. Now you, evolve this full thing with this full Hamiltonian, and then, then you trace out the baths, then you get the state of the system. So this is essentially a map from the initial state of the system to time t, and this is the this CPTP map and so on. So now if you take this time to infinity, then the system can reach some uh, steady state. In this case, it's a non-equilibrium steady state because it can have different uh, temperatures and chemical potentials of the baths. 
And uh, in many cases, uh, this steady state is unique in the sense that whichever initial state you start with, you reach the same uh, non-equilibrium steady state. Okay. Now, the, our goal is to simulate this dynamics uh, with as little as approximations as possible. Okay. So we don't want to make uh, as so we, if we don't have even small parameters, we cannot make the, any perturbation. Uh, approximation. So this is one. The other way uh, is this periodically refresh bus. Okay. So this is a different dynamics, of course, not the same dynamics. Okay. So this dynamics is like this. So it's you start. So if you read this equation in words. Okay, so it's, it, uh, since this notation is just carries out this operation, so then it means that it start, you start with the state of a system, you evolve with the, with the full uh, Hamiltonian up to a time p1, and at time p1, you detach and refresh the baths to their original initial states. Okay, and you don't do anything to the state of the system. And then you again evolve um, with the full Hamiltonian for up to a time tau. And then you again detach and refresh the baths uh, to their original initial states. And then you keep doing it in steps of time tau. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that you refresh the bath as a separable state, uh, so does, put, does it put some constraint on the time t in which you have to evolve? Because Tau, you mean? Or tau, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, this is a different. This is a. This is the periodically refreshed batch dynamics. But of course, the. I mean, this you can do. This is you can think of it as a independent or different dynamics, right? But if you want to model this dynamics via something like this, then this is the result that we were able to kind of prove, is that if this is unique, okay, then as you increase tau the state that you obtain from here and the state that you would have obtained in time n tau plus t1 approach each other, okay? Increase tau, so the, that's your answer, okay? Now, of course, uh, how can this be useful? It's useful, so this is a kind of proof, but this is not a proof, okay? This is more like a, a, a physical argument uh, that, you know, if you have a big system here uh, and, if, and if it's not, it's coupled to baths and like not uh, throughout in some places. Okay. So there can be an effective time to reach steady state, which is let's say some PSS. You can, you might get this convergence for a value of tau, which is much, much smaller than TSS. Okay. And of course you can choose T1 between uh, zero to tau. And if, if something like this happens, then simulating this dynamics becomes much, much simpler than simulating the full dynamics. And this is uh, one way you can uh, basically uh, reconstruct the full dynamics. So let's see uh, in what, what ways this is advantageous. So first thing is this map, one can show that it's entirely governed by these two functions, okay? So this is what is sometimes called the bath spectral functions. And uh, this is the, you know, the Bose distribution or the Fermi distribution corresponding to the initial state of the bath. Okay? Now, uh, there is, so initial, so our original kind of uh, setting was that we have an infinite number of modes here, okay? But there is a, like a, a given way to construct. So if you are given any function here, you can construct a tight binding chain with only first side coupled uh, to the system, such that if you, if, if this is semi-infinite and if you diagonalize this, if you go to the normal modes, you get back exactly the same modes and the same top. Okay, so this is this way of like this, this idea of reaction coordinate mapping. If you keep on doing this recursively, you end up with such a chain. Okay, now think uh, what is the dynamics that you are trying to simulate? It's so the, initially this whole chain would be in a thermal state, so it would have it would not have any dynamics. Now at initial time, you just switch on the system path coupling. So any dynamics in this chain is going to kind of uh, spread from this uh, switching on of the system but coupling. So that of course spread with some finite, since it's the nearest neighbor lattice, right? it spreads with some finite velocity. So due to Lee Robinson bounds. And so if you are evolving up to a finite time tau, you never need a infinite size chain, okay? 
So you need a chain which is roughly of order time tau. And this, this GB also you can extract from this hopping uh, rates that you can, uh, that will get, get out of this, uh, this mapping, okay? And L0 is some number that you can just add a few number, few more sites. Okay, so essentially, if, if you are do, doing this refreshed baths dynamics, you never need infinite size baths. You can do it with finite size baths, okay? So that's one. Uh, so then uh, as a numerical technique, it looks like this, right? So you want to simulate this. So you choose a value of tau. You map the baths to chains of size roughly proportional to tau. And then you have to do this full unitary evolution. Now this, uh, you might be able, if it's a many body system, you might be able to do with some tensor network techniques, like, uh, you know, whatever tensor network technique you want to use. And then you have to increase tau and look for convergence with tau. And if you get uh, enough, good enough convergence, then you know that you are kind of getting the state that you want here, okay? Now, any tensor network ways of evolving such things, okay? Uh, you know, the, the bond dimension required for a longer time evolution would grow basically, right? So that's why actually long time uh, evolutions with, in terms of tensor networks often becomes very difficult to do. But here we are never doing a long time evolution. We're only doing a finite time evolution. And every time we refresh the baths, they go back to their original initial states, which had, which, which had some low bond dimension representation. So that's why if you do it this way, uh, it requires much smaller values of bond dimension to get this. And this is actually an even bigger simplification than having finite size baths, uh, because this is essentially exponential. So if you have a program to do this unitary evolution, all you have to do is to take the output and put it as, as the input for the next step. Okay. Yeah. So what sets the time tau for convergence? Is it the, is it the time required for a disturbance to move along the system? So some, right now this time tau is actually, so it's kind of, you know, it's in some sense the finite memory time that is given by the bath, but it's hard to actually estimate it out, like straight away. So you have to look for convergence with increasing tau. Okay. okay and uh, so when you refresh the bath, you set it to the initial uh, density matrix. And for the system, you take the reduced density matrix at that time. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, all you do is see, you just take the, so you do this, you have this chain, you do the fully unitary evolution, you trace out the baths, get the state of the system, and just use this as the initial state for the next step. So you kill the entanglement between the bath and the... Exactly. The finite value of tau, you cannot make it too small. And it's also not a, just a qubit, it's a kind of a, it's a, it depends on the, the chain that, that depends on the size of the, uh, uh, like the depends, uh, the, it's a chain whose size depends on the tau and you can model arbitrary spectral function baths with this. No, it doesn't have to grow slowly enough. It has to just be bounded. Yeah, I mean, it can grow fast, but then it has to be not be too, too much, basically, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is an example that we'll look at. So this is just a nearest neighbor uh, fermionic chain with nearest neighbor uh, interactions. And the first side of the chain is attached to a bath and the last side of the chain is attached to a bath. The bath spectral functions are chosen like this. Okay, uh, so first let's do with this many body interaction set to zero, which in which case we have some exact results so we can uh, do the benchmarking, right? So let's just look at this plot. So this is a system of 16 sites. These are some different temperatures, different chemical potentials. The bath couplings are you know, one and two. So there's all of the same order, right? Uh, so we are just looking at occupation of the fifth site versus time. You can look at any other observable if you want. Uh, so this blue line is the exact uh, answer that we get with, you know, essentially infinite size baths. Okay. 
And this dashed line is the non equilibrium steady state answer that you can calculate for this. Okay, now do this refreshing in steps of time uh, uh, tau equals three. Okay. And uh, for that would require, you know, a bath size of something like eight, meaning that if you take any larger bath size, you will get exactly the same points. So these are these orange points here. And you clearly see that it does not match. Okay. But now you go to, you know, increase this to tau equals six, it just falls on the blue curve. If you go to tau equals 12, it falls on the blue curve. And of course, it also falls on tau equals six results, right? So even if it did not have the blue curve, you would know that this has converged. Okay. Um, so that is, uh, so this is how it works. This is the, this thing, but now this will give you uh, results in steps of time tau. Okay. Now, how do you reconstruct if you want, uh, like, uh, like basically all in between points, so you can reconstruct them now by playing around with this T1. So you choose a value of tau and play around with T1 and basically reconstruct the full dynamics. Okay. So just to. So th this requires essentially a bath size of 14 in this case, which is actually even smaller than the system size. Okay. So this dynamics that we are reconstructing is actually the system coupled to infinite size baths, which are, you know, with a constant, with a continuous spectral function like this, but we are reconstructing this by repeatedly using finite size baths uh, up to some small times. Okay. So, yeah. So this gamma actually does not play a role in, in uh, having your optimum LB. Uh, so it might play a role in, choose, in, in defining the value of tau, which is something that is right now you have to look for convergence and uh, see. Okay. But uh, actually this gamma, if you go back here, uh, sorry, here. So this first hopping here, that hopping comes with the that hopping is proportional to gamma. The rest of the thing is independent of gamma. Yeah. Then, no. Then uh, this see this uh, is just the first hopping that kind of increases, not the rest of it. So it doesn't really affect the Lee Robinson uh, kind of idea. If, if you go to very weak coupling, uh, so intuitively one might think that the that the setup will become more Markovian or so does that mean the convergence time tau will decrease yes. if you go to very weak coupling? Yes. That, that's the idea. See, I mean, if, the, if we could do this for arbitrarily small tau, that would be the Markovian case, right? But we cannot do this for arbitrarily small tau, as you can see here, right? Tau equals C does not work. Sorry? No, in the limit of weak coupling, we might be able to do. I think we'll be able to do. So, but we have to, we don't, I don't have the plot here, right? So this is for still for a benchmark for non-interacting case, but yeah. So now higher correlations is something that I have not looked at. Uh, and uh, if you do it in the tensor network language, it's probably a bit harder to think exactly what to do. No, higher correlations means what? I mean, different times are same time. Yeah, yeah, then it works. No, it's not zero, but it's it's small. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but uh, two time. I mean, I'm saying two time. I don't know, but equal time, everything is fine. Okay. One quick question. So, uh, how important is the single point contact for what you are doing, or is it not important? Uh, no, that's not important, but uh, it's kind of, I think, so to be advantageous, I think it's kind of important that not all sites are coupled to baths, probably. Okay, this is, I think, probably. So what I mean is, this is advantageous if the time to the steady state is much, much longer than the time where kind of the tau where it converged. Now, if you have baths everywhere and strongly coupled, it probably would reach in the same time scale. Then it's not really advantageous to do this. No, the reason I ask this question, let's say you have some 2D system and a 2D bath, then probably you'll take a strip of the system, which is connected to. That is okay. I think that is still, that will still be advantageous. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, so now, okay, now put interactions here. Now again, that is also one in this uh, simulation. So everything is one, so you don't have any perturbation parameter. And essentially the story remains same, but now you have to do this uh, tensor network techniques. And uh, yeah, so basically this black line is uh, the TBD done with some large bond dimension up to some uh, time uh, 50, which requires this kind of watt size to do. But if you do it with uh, tau equal six, you can get away with a bond dimension of 75. And of course, a bath size of uh, you know 14. Yeah. And you get basically the same points. If you do it tau equals 12, you can see that it has converged and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, the story is basically the same. Uh, if you just wanted this point by this continuous evolution, I mean, at least whatever I used in the same in the computer, it took around four days to do this. But to get it, get this point by one of these things, it took us something like this for whatever thing I used. Okay, so you see, you can see there's a big uh, advantage in doing this. But not only that, suppose you wanted to continue this curve and go up to the steady state, uh, you would require even larger bond dimension, and it would be essentially it's impossible to do like this. But uh, since you are just refreshing and this has conversed, you can keep on doing this forever and then you can reach the non equilibrium steady state. So this is what is shown here. So now I'm just plotting some different like currents between you know, the fourth and the fifth site and the 12th and 13th site and so on, so on. So you see uh, essentially the same story, but the continuous line is up to, is from the same simulation as this one. So that's up to here, but we can continue up to a long time and at the, at the end point, you can kind of see that the currents at various bonds have become same. So that is a hallmark of non-equilibrium steady state, right? So essentially we have a dynamics from initial time to the non-equilibrium steady state of an interacting system without any small parameter. So this is kind of a useful thing to do. Uh, so now, of course, this has limitations. The limitation is of course, uh, this idea that you require a unique steady state. Now it's not always, easy to uh, know from before that you will have a unique steady state, right? But it's often true in many experimentally relevant situations. The other thing is, of course, as you go more and more non-Markovian, you require larger and larger values of tau, and then you require larger and larger computation power to do this and becomes harder and harder. Okay. So now let's come back to what uh, Sai was saying. So this is essentially a type of polytional or re repeated interaction model, uh, right? What we have written down. And this kind of models are kind of uh, of interest in you know quantum information and thermodynamics, and they uh, are usually studied with like single sites, uh, not with this chains. So you can look at these uh, refer these references for a kind of a review. Now the question is, instead of thinking of this as a numerical technique, can we actually realize this kind of uh, dynamics, uh, and then we can kind of maybe try to think of some thermodynamics of this process. Okay, so that's essentially this paper. Uh, but uh, okay, before uh, thinking about exactly this process, I just want to uh, introduce like exactly what I mean by thermodynamics of something like this. So let's say we have a situation, general situation like this, where we have a system coupled to many baths. So it can be two, it can be more than two. Um, and uh, the drive is in the system and in the system bath couplings. Okay, the baths are not directly accessible. You only know the temperatures, maybe the chemical potentials and maybe the spectral function of the bath. Okay. So in that case, uh, if, it is, if the drive is periodic, then uh, in the long time limit, the system can go into a periodic kind of a state. And there you can uh, define something like power, which is the, uh, the energy, the time period average energy uh, into the system. So basically the whole total Hamiltonian of system and baths and the time period average of that, the expectation value of that, okay? And uh, you know, heat currents, if you do not have any chemical potentials, these are like energy currents into the bath and then time period average. Now, the one question is like, which way does the energy flow or what are the signs of the heat currents and power, okay? So of course there are eight uh, possibilities of which these four are impossible. And this is because of these two things. And if you look at these two things, this looks like first law, this looks like second law. 
But these two equations can be microscopically derived, assuming only that initially the system was in some arbitrary state, the baths were in thermal states. With, the, with no further approximation, with, with no further assumption, you can derive these two equations, right? So these two looks like first law and second law. And now we can kind of interpret uh, these four configurations as like heater, accelerator, refrigerator, and heat engine. And of course, these two are the most studied ones. Um, so a refrigerator is like your uh, heat current is flowing from the cold bath, okay? And a heat engine is like power is negative. So it's like you're extracting power. Okay, so, and, and these are some references you can look into for this. So how do we realize now the, the, this periodically refreshed bath process? So this is one way uh, someone might think of realizing this, okay? So the idea is like this. So we have a system and suppose you want to do it with two baths. So we have two copies of each bath. For the first time tau, we couple to one copy, one set of copies. And then exactly at time tau, we switch to the lower set of copies. Now, in a time tau, if you think of it again in this chain kind of picture, uh, only a finite number of modes of the bath has been affected. So when the bath is decoupled from the system, the remaining number of modes are going to re-thermalize it back to its original initial state. Let's say that this happens effectively in some time tau r, okay? So if your tau is larger than tau r, and if you just switch between the upper ones and the lower ones in steps of time tau, the system sees basically refreshed baths in steps of time tau, okay? Now this, of course, assumes, I mean, this is, in a theorist construct, this is with this non-interacting baths and so on, but this doesn't really have to be like that, right? I mean, in general, uh, any experimental baths uh, will have some relaxation time. And it's, I'm just saying that we uh, couple to the other baths for a time longer than the relaxation time of the baths, okay? So this is like that. Now, if you have, if you reduce tau to something which is, now, you know, like tau is smaller than tau r, it's between one and two, this ratio. Then you need one more copy of the bath, such that, you know, you, you leave this bath alone for a time two tau, such that it just relaxes back to its original initial state. Okay. And likewise, if you play this game a uh, little bit more, then you see that, you know, in general, you require this many number of copies of the baths to realize um, the process. Okay. Now, of course, if you require larger number of baths, it becomes harder to realize but it gives you a kind of a number to talk about, like how difficult it is to uh, realize this. Now, if you go to the steady state of this process, right? So then it looks like this. So the both baths operate on it, but it gives back the same state at the end of time tau, right? So within this time tau, you know, it's in the language of the previous picture, some heat has been exchanged with the baths, some work has been done because we have switched the system bath couplings, and if there is some chemical potential, some chemical work can also be done. So this is like a single stroke thermodynamic cycle. Now, one important difference with standard thermodynamic cycle is that it does not go back to a state which is close to equilibrium. It is always far from equilibrium, okay? Okay, so now, of course, uh, yeah. So this is a repetition of uh, what was uh, shown before. But the main point here is that in order to calculate, you have to analyze the thermodynamic cycle, what we need is are the time period averaged energy current and the time period averaged particle current into the baths. This is what we have to calculate. Now, suppose we know the steady state now uh, of, the, of, the, of this process, then we can calculate this object by uh, taking one step of this process. And again, one step of this process would require only to simulate one state of this process would require only a finite number of modes in the bath. However, as we saw, to realize this process, you require the baths to be having infinite number of degrees of freedom so, such that when the bath is not coupled to the system, it kind of relaxes. And also to make sense of thermodynamics, you actually require, you know, uh, macroscopic baths, okay? 
but the dynamics or the thermodynamics can be calculated using only finite size. So now, okay, we have to find this steady state. So how do we find it? Like we can find with tensor network techniques like we found in the previous example. But if you have only like, you know, free fermion models, you can even do something better. You can find it in terms of this discrete type time Lyapunov equation. It's, which is very, I find it very interesting because you know, this kind of uh, equations feature in completely on different branches of like uh, maths and engineering and so on, uh, but it also features here. And uh, this is very simple. Once you have something like this is very simple because uh, these equations are so well studied that any high level language like uh, Mathematica, MATLAB, Python, whatever, you just have to provide this matrix G and this matrix P and they'll give you the solution, okay? So, and like I said, it's usually it may not be very easy to know whether you have a unique steady state or not. But once you have this picture, you can check if the uh, steady state is unique uh, by saying that, you know, the eigenvalues of uh, this have to have, if the eigenvalues of this have magnitude less than one, then the steady state is unique. Okay. So now we know how to uh, calculate uh, the steady state of something like this. And I should also mention that this is also true for arbitrary dimension and geometry. And, uh, you know, there are other, this is for this prep process, but this is a class of this collisional or repeated interaction models. Uh, and this equation, this kind of equation is true for uh, all those classes of models, uh, but uh, I've not really seen this written down uh, in many other places. So now uh, in previous uh, part, we were trying to find a large value of tau, which matches some dynamics and so on. In this case, we are just interested in the thermodynamics and we'll study this as a function of tau. Now tau is a uh, control parameter. We don't care about reproducing some other dynamics. We're interested in what thermodynamics that this dynamics gives us, okay? So we'll do that for this extremely simple model now, okay? So we have two Fermionic sites, okay? Each site has its own set of baths with which it kind of sequentially connects, okay? And uh, each bath has this Lorentzian kind of spectral function, which you can, if you do this reaction coordinate mapping, it, you can think of this as one mode here, which has its own relaxation time, which is constant like two lambda, okay? So you have this system. And now if you, here we know what is the relaxation time of this thing, right? It's like two, one by two lambda, right? So the, here we know what is the number of copies we would require you know, for uh, such as if you want to realize such a thing. And if you take this lambda to zero, in that case, you don't have this, this other bath, then you see the number of copies goes to infinity. And this is basically the standard collisional model or the repeated interaction model uh, thing uh, where people, uh, which even Sarang was kind of talking about, you have a uh, qubit and you couple with it and it then it goes away and you keep on doing it with the infinite uh, set of qubits. So instead of infinite, you have finite here because you have this uh, relaxation time. Okay, and we choose uh, one of the baths to be higher temperature, uh, lower, yeah. So this is higher temperature, this is lower temperature. And we put the chemical potentials to be same so that there is no chemical work and so on. So the only source of power, if you think of this as thermodynamic cycle, comes from switching on and off of this uh, system bath couplings, okay? So let's uh, see one, uh, uh, interesting regime of this. So this idea of periodically refreshed refrigerator. Uh, so a refrigerator con uh, con uh, configuration is something like this, that your uh, heat comes out of the cold bath, okay? And you put in some power. So there is a coefficient of performance of this, uh, which if you calculate, you can rigorously show that this is less than the Carnot coefficient of the coefficient of performance for a Carnot cycle, which is this one, okay? And in traditional thermodynamic cycles, this highest coefficient of performance uh, occurs in the limit of reversible uh, uh, cycle, like in the limit where you do the cycle extremely slowly. And in that case, also the cooling rate kind of goes to zero. So there is a trade-off between the cooling rate and the coefficient of performance as a function of the cycle duration. Okay, 
So what do we see in our case? We see something like this. Okay, so this is, you know, we have three values of lambda, you know, lambda was uh, the sitting in the spectral function. So a smaller value of lambda means the spectral function is more highly peaked. Okay. Um, so this is current uh, into the cold bath. So when it is negative, then it is, we are in the refrigerating configuration. This is the power. So this is the coefficient of performance whenever the thing is refrigerating. And this is the entropy production rate. Okay. Now, uh, there are several interesting things to see. First of all, uh, okay, so at our value of tau, which is close to one, uh, you have the maximum uh, cooling rate. But at the same value of tau, you have also the kind of close to the same value of tau, you also have the highest coefficient of performance. So this is not, there is no trade-off between coefficient of performance and cooling rate as a function of tau. It's most efficient at a finite value of tau. And also at the same, at the close to the same value of tau, the entropy production rate is also maximum. So entropy production rate quantifies how far you are from the reversible uh, limit. So if it is zero, you are close to reversible limit. So you, here you are farthest from the reversible limit is where you are kind of most efficient. And also the uh, cooling rate is more is higher. So this is very different from traditional thermodynamic cycles, right? Um, but uh, what do you pay actually? So you do pay as little uh, something, which is that if you want to realize this for this value of tau, you will require a much larger number of uh, uh, copies of the baths than let's say somewhere here. Okay, so that is it, it. Might be a bit harder to realize that that point, but uh, you see this has some interesting uh, different behaviors from standard thermodynamic cycles. And um, yeah, so why does this this thing happen? So why do we see that uh, you know uh, this uh, everything is kind of peaked around tau equals one? And one is remember the so if you okay, one is the so basically g is one, so that is a system uh, time scale. Okay. So we do not completely understand why this happens, but this is the following is the idea. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so you have something, so there is something called uh, anti-Zeno effect. So Zeno effect is when if you monitor a dynamics too much, you slow it down. But uh, there is also something called anti-Zeno effect, which is if you monitor a dynamics uh, not too much, but uh, to some extent, you can even speed up the dynamics. In our uh, setting, this refreshing of the bath is like, you know, monitoring is like, it's, it's in some sense analogous to monitoring the dynamics. So if you refresh uh, too fast, you slow down, but if you refresh uh, to some extent, you can speed up the dynamics. And that is shown here. So in this, in terms of this equation, you can calculate uh, this value R, which gives you the rate at which you approach the steady state. And is plotted as a function of tau. You see that this is peaked uh, close to uh, where the tau is closer uh, of the order of system time scales. And it is close to these values only where we see Entropy production is maximum, heat current is maximum, everything is uh, maximum. So I think, so th we think this is what is happening here. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, advantages has been uh, seen in uh, some other works also, but in a very different context, not with uh, this refreshing of bus. Uh, so yeah. So uh, yeah, so essentially you see this, uh, this uh, periodic refresh bus is a kind of uh, playground for various kinds of interesting things. And it's also a good numerical technique. So this is uh, for these uh, works, but there are also, we have done some other works on this. So this is the idea of mesoscopic leads, which is uh, kind of related. This is another thing you can use to simulate open quantum mini body systems. And uh, then we found that this mesoscopic leads and this refreshing bars are kind of related together. And so this is what we pointed out here. And then we, we do the you know, thermodynamics with this mesoscopic leads also in this paper. So yeah, with that, I'd like for your attention. Now uh, it's now time for questions and comments. So any questions, comments? Uh, so you said that the technique breaks down if there are multiple steady states. So what about it break, breaks down? Why, what doesn't work? No, we could not prove. Uh, so 
we, I mean, we could not prove this. I mean, yeah, so this, this proof is only when this is unique. Okay, but so, so suppose you have some conserved quantity of the system yeah. uh, that will remain conserved the way you are evolving as well, right? So you'll all, always remain in that sector, yeah. uh, but still uh, you're saying it cannot be. Yeah, so actually, I mean, the point is we could prove it like for this case, okay? Now, if there are cases outside this where this can be proven, that might be true, but uh, yeah, that might be a case where it can be proven. But I know at least one case where it, it's, it does not work. Okay. Okay. question about this so this uh, uh, so so you need to evolve for till a time which is proportional to the length of the reservoirs right it's more like yeah i mean the, you have to choose one of these things is your, is something that you choose so if you choose a value of tau then uh, you choose the value of the uh, kind of the length of the reservoir uh -huh. uh, and then you look for convergence with increasing the value of tau so these two things are connected these two things are not independent of each other no, I, I wanted to ask that if the reservoirs are like itself 2D, then there are two length scales, right? So any idea ah, okay. with the other, other length scale would so come this, in? So this, I think I, we have to discuss more, but uh, I have a feeling that if you, if effectively the reservoir can be written like a, a, a one spectral function, then you can bring it down to a 1D shape. But uh, it's only if you can write it like a one spectral function. So, uh, did you check this uh, technique uh, with the uh, Anderson impurity model? Yes, so that is uh, a very important point. So I, I have not checked, but this is something that uh, I have been in my do list. But uh, I have a feeling that this technique is not going to be very advantageous for that case, because um, in that case, you have strong coupling to the baths, and you have just a simple a small system. So you'll probably just reach the steady state, uh, you know, in, in not too long time, probably, uh, probably, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, Chuck, uh, two, uh, two quick questions. One is, um, uh, is there an inherent promise? So, you know, I'm trying to think about applying this to, you know, just a, a priori, an unknown system where I don't have a handle on the exact dynamics. What is, how do I get a handle on the inherent, uh, you know, promise that is required where I know that this technique will work because I, it will always put out something when you simulate it. Yeah, so actually the, the thing you, if you do not have any idea, then I think the way, only way to think about is, is you do this, you know, increase tau and look for convergence. It's a bit like okay. when you do like tensor network simulations, you sometimes don't know what is the oh, no. that you need. Perfect. So you just, uh, yeah. Uh, the other question that I had was uh, each lambda is a CP map, right? Yes. Uh, and so if the, if the lambda has multiple steady states, right? So for instance, if it has a strong symmetry, then the problem that you are having, I think this is the question that Shovan was asking as well. The problem that you're having is basically that when you start with row zero, uh, lambda might not actually fully put it in the steady state. Yeah. And so it might, you know, it might pick one of the multi-stability. Is that the issue that uh, yeah, something like physically that. is oh, happening? I mean, uh, but uh, I mean, one thing like, you know, the, uh, this thing is going to be attractive, right? I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, okay. This is a, I mean, I'm not completely sure, but it kind of complicates the derivation. So I we could not really sure. uh, think but about Numerically, it. did you try and simulate? Like for instance, is benzene with- uh, uh, No. Symmetries. Okay. Thanks. But I, I actually found one case where it does not work. That is the uh, spin boson model uh, with uh, this super omic spectral function. Okay, so that dynamics actually goes into something like, you know, almost unitary in the long term. Okay, so that is definitely not captured by something like this. Okay, well, let's chat. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, so you, how difficult is uh, this uh, this whole process for low temperature? For example, the choice of this tau. Um, if you do a fermionic problem like what Rosario was also saying, like Anderson impurity model, if you go to a low temperature, uh, you expect tau to be much much larger, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, usually, yeah, that is going to happen. Uh, but you know, 
so, yeah. so, so in other words, it, it, it depends on the decay, typical decay time scale of the bath, which allows you to have this. That is one of the parameters, one of the actually, parameters. you know, like, but it, we found that it also depends. I mean, if you just do it on that, you might get a, a very bad number in the sense, like it might overestimate and then you require, then you think that you have to do a lot, uh, work a lot harder than you actually need to. Yeah. Uh, if there's no questions, so let's thank the speaker again.